Linux Luddites, episode 80, for the 13th of June, 2016. Welcome to Linux Luddites, the show where we try all the latest free and open source software and then decide that we like the old stuff better. I'm Joe. I'm Jesse. And I'm Paddy. Now, we've got a fair amount of feedback following our recent chat about net neutrality, so we'll return to that topic later in the show. Plus, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit and suggest that open source development practices are leading to more bugs and lower quality code. So stick around to hear if Joe and Jesse agree. But before we get into all of that, and also last fortnight's news. I gather you've been gifted a piece of tech you'd like to talk about, Joe. Yes, Paul Gleason, who I think listens to the show. I'm not sure. I think he listens sometimes. Anyway, sent me a Pebble, an original Pebble smartwatch. Now, it's obviously a bit behind the times, a lot behind the times, because there's been, what, the uh, Pebble Time? The Pebble um, Silver? Steel? Oh, Steel, that's it, yeah. Uh, and now they're in the midst of a Kickstarter for a new one. So it, it's pretty old hat, but that doesn't mean that it's not useful and good. And this is the second smartwatch I've ever owned. The first one was just a horrible Chinese disaster that was just a standalone version of Android, and I couldn't connect it to anything else, and it was just a complete waste of time. Whereas this is totally dependent on a phone. And it, I found that it's actually quite useful. It's not just folly. It's... All it does is give you notifications pretty much. You can install apps on it, um, which are a bit of a novelty, like Flappy Bird and a few other games. And there's a lot of fitness tracking stuff, but not being the uh, the fittest of people, <laughs> I think it's fair to say, if anyone's Stop met me. Laughing, Paddy. <laughs> that doesn't really appeal to me. But the, getting the notifications is cool, and I can even reply to them. I mean, I was on my way out the other night to meet you, Jesse, and you confirmed what pub. Uh, we were meeting in and I was able to do a canned reply on the watch to say, okay, so that, you know, to acknowledge receipt of the the message. So little things like that are actually quite useful. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a total toy that's totally unnecessary, but at the same time, it means I can just have my phone on silent and then my wrist buzzes and then I look at it and I can see whether I actually want to look at my phone, whether it's just an automated server email that I'll check later or whether it's something that I actually want to deal with right now so i'm very pleased with it so the original pebble what sort of sort of inputs and outputs does it have you've mentioned buzzing you've mentioned um tracking steps and things i wonder whether how much of the phone is doing that and how much of the the watch is doing that well as far as i know it has got an accelerometer because you can use that for some games there's a version of pong where you can use the you can sort of tilt your arm to move the uh the paddle or whatever it's called so it's got an accelerometer in it um otherwise i think it's just got bluetooth uh, and most of the stuff's happening on the phone, I think, um, in terms of you need to have the Pebble app to push any apps to the, the watch itself. Um, although I did find in F-Droid, there is an app, I can't remember what it's called now, which allows you to interact with a Pebble without any proprietary evil software. So that, that is an option if you're a real you know, freedom lover. But in terms of input and output, it's not a touchscreen. It's, it's a black and white e-paper display which is always on and it's got four buttons on it and you have to interact with it with the buttons so there's no swiping and gestures and all that kind of stuff which i don't know suits me really on a tiny screen like that touch input doesn't really make that much sense to me yeah your thumb would be about a quarter the size of the screen wouldn't it? you'd never be able to actually use it a quarter my thumb covers the screen pretty much <laughs> Well, we have some feedback about the Pebble watches as well and how they interact with Android. So that's in the one of our two feedback segments. But should we get on the news first? Yeah, let's do it. But yeah, as I said, thank you very much, Paul, for sending me it. Very happy with it. So let's start off the news with OwnCloud and NextCloud then. And I almost started this by saying everyone's heard about it, but I said that about the uh, Google I.O. last time and we got some feedback to say that not everyone had heard about that. So let's explain it properly. Um, OwnCloud 
Everyone's heard of that, surely. <laughs> <laughs> File syncing, and we are not that favorable of it. I don't know. We haven't really talked about any of the more recent versions, but we reviewed an older version and weren't very impressed. Is that fair to say? Yeah, maybe we were sort of pitching it too highly with Google Drive and, and equivalents because we were really trying to see if we could use it instead of Google Drive for our show notes and our sort of collaborative editing on there. And it kept on falling over and, and someone would make an edit and it wouldn't save or someone couldn't see it until a minute later and it had synced up. So it wasn't very good from that point of view. I mean, some of the other features, um, being able to hold contacts and, and calendar entries and stuff seemed to work. But it, it did seem a bit clunky. Maybe those are too many things uh, being added onto it and trying to do too many things at once. Yeah, and the file syncing was somewhat iffy as well, wasn't it? Yeah, and we'll get back to the too many things being added to it, I suspect, as we get into this a bit further. This controversy has been brewing for a while, hasn't it? Frank, the fellow who started the whole project, left the company a few weeks ago, and we covered that, and we were a bit bemused by it. Why would someone who started the project and founded the company leave all of a sudden and then a few more people started to leave and it became clear that things were just not very good there you know that things were going wrong at the the whole project so i've not seen any sort of evidence of of what's been going on within own cloud as in as in whether or not the there was you know general discontent or whether there was some sort of changes in the management what have you but you're right it does look like uh, the main guy and a whole load of the absolute core contributors and the people who are writing all the code for own cloud have all suddenly stepped out uh, and have produced a new version or, or a fork of own cloud called next cloud ah but before that happened the own cloud foundation was launched which seemingly was a response to the the issues that Frank and others had brought up about the, uh, I suppose the the problems, the issues with the company having too much involvement and too much influence over the the code and I suppose the product. But it was very shortly after that that the fork was announced, and I say announced because that's all we've got at the moment. We don't actually have any code, do we? Yeah, they said there's going to be a fork of own cloud, as I mentioned, and they've sort of tried to say what their focus is going to be. But you're right, there's nothing actually tangible that we can look at and compare and, and see where it is. I mean, it's going to take a while to take own cloud, um, remove whatever it is they're, they're not happy with and start redoing the code to produce something which is you know, a, a worthy competitor. So I suppose it's a bit of a case of, of watch this space for that. Yeah, they have promised sort of within the next few weeks, to be fair. Yeah, but for this next few weeks, we're a bit in limbo, aren't we? Own Cloud is still available. You can still download it. You can still deploy it on loads of hosting providers. But would you do that right now? If you had a new installation to do, a new deployment, would you go for somewhat tried and tested Own Cloud or would you wait for Next Cloud? It feels like we're in purgatory at the moment. Well, the NextCloud guys have said that they're going to make it easy to move over and seamless transition, all these sorts of things. So obviously they know the code base, they're the people who wrote it. And so they're going to work out a way in which you can have a, you know, an own cloud instance, which many both enterprise users and homes sort or of domestic users have got and make a way of, of transitioning over. And especially if you've just forked own cloud, you know, the code base can be almost identical. There's not going to be a lot of changing going on. Um, and then maybe the real uh, big improvements or, or the differences that they're trying to make will be more obvious sort of further down the line. Yeah, and they've also said they'll honour any support arrangements that people have purchased with own cloud. They'll take those on board with the next cloud project. Um, obviously, this has had a big impact on own cloud as an organisation. I mean, they had a company in the United States which has shut up shop now because the funding's been withdrawn after this announcement. Um, I mean, the German side of things is still trundling along. But you're right, Joe, I don't think anyone would sensibly go out and deploy this now because it is very much, as you say, in limbo, what's actually going on. Well, can we just return to that topic of supporting own cloud customers? Where's the money going to come from from that? If the money's gone to own cloud, I, I just don't understand how you would transition that because you can't charge them again if they've paid a contract for a certain period. I, I just don't understand the logistics the the you know how that is practically going to happen no you're right they're not going to be charging them again uh they just said they'll honor the obligations that own cloud have, have made um obviously being funded off their own backs 
Well, not really. I mean, they're in bed with this company called, is it Spready or Spreed Me? Yeah, which I hadn't heard of, but which seems to be um, not a cool thing to say, really. Everyone seems to be at least pretending like they'd heard of this company. And they do uh, web conferencing and VoIP Skype type stuff, but it is open source. So why have we never tried it? Because none of us have heard of it. So, I mean, it, it does sound like one of the big kind of um, bastions of what they're going to actually add to, uh, I was about to say OwnCloud, but what I mean, what I mean now is, is NextCloud. To have like this, something that OwnCloud has always missed is um, a voice conferencing facilities. And, you know, that's probably more aimed at the enterprise, but would also be quite useful for, well, you know, the average Joe like us. How can you say it's something they've always missed? I mean, the kitchen sink's about the only thing that's been missed from own cloud. And yeah, uh, I mean, the, the, it's so unUnixy, isn't it? Own cloud, uh, well, next cloud now, in that it just does so many things, and it's you know a jack of all trades and a master of none. And now they're going to add this feature to it. Shouldn't they perfect what they already do before they start adding massive new features like this to it? But how can you compete with Microsoft if if Microsoft have got uh, your calendar and your mail and uh, you know documents that everyone can edit, and you you don't have the full suite to compare one to one? So you're missing out on on voice conferencing, which you know we use at work, not using Home Cloud or whatever this thing with me was. Um, so I, th- I think you've got to come out with a competitor that can do the same things as you know the big market dominating leader at the moment now yeah there are loads of other things that it can do with these various add-ons but they're all sort of superfluous add-ons that third parties or or, or keen people are doing well the other question is if all the money is coming from this one company surely the problems that they had before are just going to continue if you've got a company who needs to make money and has uh, you know the the bottom line as the the only factor that really matters when it comes down to it can they really restructure this can they structure it in a in a different enough way to make it actually work and not have further problems and not have you know next cloud 2 or whatever they're going to call it when they fork it again i think that's a really good question and i've been immensely disappointed by the reporting around this in the for an open source world um I've heard an interview with Frank and Joss, and I also watched a video cast that Brian Lunduk hosted. And to say they were given softball questions from those two, lots of folks, is somewhat of an understatement. There's been no critical reporting, no difficult questions asked here at all. And I mean, I'm not interested enough to have invited them on the show to find out what the truth is, but we don't know what's gone on. We don't know what the future is likely to look like. And I'm a little bit disappointed, as I say, that people seem to be more interested in giving them a platform to do advocacy for this particular FOSS project than they are for actually finding out what's happened out there, really. Is that partly because OwnCloud has always been a bit of a golden boy of open source? You know, it's, it's the only um, single place you can have all of these abilities in one. It's the only competitor we have to have your you know, your own cloud version of, of things like Google Drive and that. And so it, it has to be held up as a as a, something that everyone has to like. You know, I'm, I'm not saying they have to. What I'm saying is that it's been it's been that way in the past because it's the only one we can possibly look at. I mean, when we've looked at it, we've been fairly uh, realistic, let's say. Um, whereas you hear other podcasts or reviews of it, and it's always gets you know very positive reviews, which I don't I don't think we always agree with. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's part of the large problem here that a lot of other podcasts and media aren't critical enough. I mean, I realize that's perhaps one of the negatives, if you like, about this show is that we are sometimes perceived as being very negative. As you said, though, it's realism, and we try and be pragmatic about things and honest about things. And there seems to be an absence of that elsewhere at the moment around this particular project. So one issue that I'd like to get your guys' opinion on is branding and mindshare. And I had an interesting discussion on Google Plus about this this week. And I I started that discussion by saying, I still know a fair number of normal people who aren't into Linux or FOSS or any of that stuff, aren't particularly technical, who are still using OpenOffice rather than LibreOffice. They haven't even heard of LibreOffice. And that's because OpenOffice established itself as a free version of Office that was decent and generally worked reasonably well if you were only doing basic stuff like writing letters. Free as in beer, I mean. And 
Various people countered that argument by saying that those normal non-technical people are not going to install own cloud or next cloud. It's not really consumer software. It, it's more for, uh, I don't know, tinkerers like us, peep, sysadmins, you know, that's kind of thing. It's not consumer facing software. Do you think that that is a fair enough argument? Do you think that it doesn't really matter that own cloud has got this, this big mind share at the moment and that next cloud will just take that mind share fairly quickly? Are you sort of asking if next cloud is the Libre office to own clouds open office? Well, I think that is very clear. I mean, the, the, I don't think there's any debate about that. But the question that I do have is, d- does it really matter that they are losing all of this brand awareness and mindshare and starting a completely new thing, even though it's effectively the same code, but they've they've lost all of that branding? Does that really matter because of the people who this is aimed at? Technical people who are probably aware of forks and follow the news and listen to shows like ours and are aware of why they should probably start using Nextcloud. I mean, I suppose that's a different debate whether or not they should, but I I see it being the standard now of moving forward. Like very few technical people use OpenOffice, they all use LibreOffice. Yeah, 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 I get you. Okay, so I would would agree that this is in the realm of people who are um, tinkerers and keen and keen enough that they are uh, aware of the changes that go on. You're saying that people were disconnected with um, where the free, uh, as in beer, where the best free um, word competitor was. And that's fine. They they were disconnected and didn't see the changes that went on that we're all aware of for LibreOffice and things like this. But I think that the people who are in companies who have deployed this, um, the people who listen to this show, you know, we've got many people who talk about um, own cloud when we've reviewed it and things. I think they are clued up and keen enough to be reading the kinds of websites that will tell them that what is going on and all this. So I, I agree that you could have three or four small competitors to own cloud and the people who are deploying that sort of software would be aware of all four and know the benefits and negatives of each because they are invested in a way that people who want to write to their MP or you know their gran or whatever you need word aren't invested in that same way. And let's be honest, Nextcloud is a is a good is a good title because it implies the other one was rubbish. This is the future. It's you know it it already they've got some good marketing going on. So I guess to summarise the long winded question, a long winded answer, the answer is yes, and it's not a problem at all from a branding perspective because everyone who needs to know will know about it. Okay, well we'll see what happens with it. Hopefully they'll produce some code fairly soon, and if this conferencing software is any good then maybe we can give it a try and potentially even move over to it so now they just need to work out a copied version of minecraft or something similar and put that in as well (laughs) following (laughs) jesse's logic they've got to have everything microsoft has (laughs) (laughs) okay i was going to move on so firefox have released version 47 and it's got improved handling for streaming html5 and some other goodies brilliant what everyone's talking about, though, is 48 has now moved to beta, and the benefit of this is that it's using some new code called electrolysis, um, and what that allows is for the user interface to be a different process from the tabs. So whereas uh, Google Chrome, every single tab is a different process, that can mean that you end up with a lot of RAM being used because you've got all these different processes going on. And this is sort of halfway between what uh, Firefox is now and what Google Chrome has. So you have you have multiple processes, but not every single tab. And their rollout actually is is quite interesting as well. They're looking at doing a 1% rollout. So when you sort of do an auto update, only 1% of people will get that update. And they'll clearly have some sort of um, feedback mechanism where they'll see how it's working and maybe, you know, do uh, non-user uh, information coming back to the servers and things just to see how the rollout's working. And then they'll, if that goes well, up the number of rollouts over the weeks. Um, but they're saying they can even sort of slow down, pause, and even disable this electrolysis um, if, if things go wrong further down the line, when, you know, before they've ironed out all the all the bugs that might be there. So it looks like an interesting way of rolling it out, but also, I'd say, uh, should improve the performance of Firefox 48 and above. Well, you say improve the performance, but at what cost? Massive amounts of RAM, in some cases twice as much, 
which if you've got a a nice i7 machine with 16 gigs of RAM, then you're not going to be bothered probably. But if you're using Firefox on an old system, then potentially this is going to be very bad news for you. Yeah, and I was curious about this because obviously I do run Chrome, I'm afraid, as I hate freedom. Um, and I'm aware that it is a little bit on the fat side these days, but I'd never actually had a look to see how much RAM each tab uses. So I did a variety of experiments using box standard Chrome and Chromium as well I installed, um, both signed in and out and with extensions and what have you. And I found that a completely empty tab will use between 12 and 15 megabytes um, out of the box before anything's loaded into it, which doesn't sound a lot, but I guess once you multiply that by 20, 30 tabs, perhaps you've got open plus the content in them, you can see where all your RAM does go. But I've got a question whether what Firefox is doing is only sort of half-baked, really, because if you're just separating the UI and all the content into two separate processes, it does mean your content could crash all the other content, surely. Or am I misunderstanding things? That was my understanding, yeah, but it means that at least the whole browser won't crash. But, yeah, if you're going to do it, why not just do it properly? Either or, either use loads of resources and make it more secure and you know less prone to crashing, or don't bother and do it like they have been. But the other issue is extensions, and there are an awful lot of extensions available for Firefox. And some of them will be fine with this change, but some of them won't. Things like NoScript, which... I would have thought the the kind of person who is still, you know, hanging on to the free software dream of using Firefox, they're the kind of person who's going to be using stuff like NoScript. And if that's going to stop working, then potentially it's going to drive them over to something like Chromium. Or more likely, there'll be yet another fork of Firefox. Because I don't know, is Pale Moon going to do this? I suppose I should have looked that up before asking the question. I don't suppose you two have either. But I suppose it might be only a temporary thing extensions not working once it is fully deployed and everyone's using it maybe the developers of those extensions will um, rewrite them but it seems like an awful lot of work for them potentially well as has been said many times before we'll have to keep an eye on that but let's move to a, a slightly speculative story if you like and it's one that picks up on an idea we've talked about before on the show and that idea is that whilst google's been wrapping more and more functionality into its proprietary code on android it could well accelerate that process and could effectively abandon AOSP altogether. And the article we'll be linking to is reporting the thoughts of analyst Richard Windsor, who claims that there's a secret project within Google to rewrite the ART runtime as part of Google's efforts to grab hold of the incredibly fragmented Android ecosystem, if you like, and impose a single vision, their single vision, of the platform upon most manufacturers and carriers. I'm not having this. I'm afraid. I don't think that Google could get away with it because all of the custom ROM developers and, you know, all of the people who are, you know, the, the community side of things, they'd be up in arms and it'd just be terrible PR for them. I mean, I could see them rolling more and more functionality into the proprietary side of things, which they have been continuing to do. But I think that fundamentally Android has to say, open source, doesn't it? I mean, surely. The kernel has to because of the GPL, but because it is GPL 2 rather than 3, it means that they could put loads of proprietary stuff around it. They could basically build a proprietary OS with it as long as they release that kernel source. But I, I just can't see it happening. It would just be too... I know that it's a, a minority of people who are into that, but I think they're quite a vocal minority and it would be it would make custom ROMs impossible if they did this. And the the PR disaster that they'd get from that, I think, would be... It probably wouldn't affect the bottom nine that much at all, if anything, but it would leave a really bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, I think. Yeah, I suspect you're right. I mean, Windsor's well aware of the backlash that further hobbling or dropping of ASP would cause. But he thinks that the ongoing uh, litigation between Google and Oracle may provide the excuse they actually need to get this done because he believes, as do I, that Oracle will win on appeal and therefore as a side effect, it'll nicely set Google up to push out some major changes to Android, uh, supposedly by way of respecting that judgment. But haven't they made those changes already by moving to OpenJDK? Well, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, it's been 
proposed that they'll be using OpenJDK for the N version. Um, I couldn't think what the name was. That's because there isn't a name yet. <laughs> Nougat. <laughs> Nutella. We've had this. Let's move on. <laughs> All right. Uh, Nougat. Um, I obviously haven't got my hands on that because I've not got a device that I can play with with it. Um, equally, I'd be surprised if they did stick with it long term. I mean, partly because it is an Oracle derived product still, and partly because it's uh, released under the GPL. And Google have had a long dislike of anything apart from the kernel being in Android that's GPL'd. Well, this is all very speculative and it's all just opinions at this stage. We'll have to see what happens again, keep an eye on it as usual. So let's move on to the fact that according to Recode, the app boom is over. And that's because the average American installs zero apps per month now on their phone. And that the the facts and, and figures pretty much show that most people have got a set of apps that they use now and aren't really inclined to install new ones because why would they? They've got everything that they need working. Apart from a few kind of new things like Snapchat and Uber, although Snapchat's not very new, but I think it's gaining in popularity all the time. But if you look at, I suppose I'm not a very good use case, but I very infrequently install new apps these days. I've got pretty much everything I need. I don't see why you're not a good use case. I, I was just thinking what the last app I installed, and I uninstalled it about two days later. And apart from that, I can't think of anything that's that's being new. You know, you've got, well, various messaging apps, as we we touched on in the Google I.O. chat last show, um, and all the techie apps for, you know, doing SSH and bits and bobs, and then nothing else really, really changes. I agree. I think it's a case of you found the ones you like, and it's not until... Um, an app that you've been using for a long time has a massive shift in how they operate or the you know they move to a material design you don't like or they for some reason change it fundamentally you're not going to go out and look for a new music app every two weeks you're not going to go out and look for a new camera app every fortnight it, it's just sort of you're you've found the ones you like and, and that's it it's only when someone recommends one out of the blue that you might look at a new one i think yeah, so I think what we're saying really is that this is actually a function of a mature market where everyone who needs a phone, I, re I retract that totally, everyone who wants a phone <laughs> has got a phone. and I need got, a phone. Got, got their set of apps installed and they're happy bunnies. Um, obviously, the situation is slightly different in developing markets, but so is the use of apps. I mean, people have been assuming for a long time that markets like China will pursue the same sort of trajectory as we have in the West and that isn't the case at all. I mean, things like WeChat, which are immensely popular over there and have a completely different app ecosystem where there are apps and bots actually built into WeChat itself, um, are very popular indeed. And they aren't in this sort of side of the world. But it does mean that established apps that you see on the App Store and you use on your phone day to day are unlikely to make a big impact over there. Talking about WeChat, so I was chatting to a friend who came back from China for a business trip, and they were saying this WeChat has, it's like one app, and then within it, you've got your banking app and your messaging app and your taxi app and, and you know, food apps and all this kind of stuff. And it's all sort of within this one little ecosystem. It's like an ecosystem within an ecosystem. Is, is that roughly how it works? Yeah, very much so. I stuck a post up on Google Plus a while back, sort of suggesting the world's going that way, and nobody seemed to take much notice of it. But it, it is very much how the world works over there. And I think it's one of the reasons why Google themselves have gone down the route of trying to put bots and intelligent assistants into their chat apps to actually sort of follow the same path. Because, as you say, if you can lock people into that ecosystem and make people develop apps for it, well, I mean, it's just like Facebook in a way, isn't it? There are apps within Facebook that people use. People play their sort of gardening games and what have you. And Facebook to them is their computing experience and everything within it. It's, it's building a nice little wall garden there. Sounds like pretty bad news for independent developers then. If you're not working for a huge company, then your app doesn't stand much of a chance of getting downloaded by many people. Yeah, I guess we need to take games out of this because, you know, they sort of come and go and you always need a, a new game to hook you. But I do think you're right there. Unless, you're, unless your app is related to something big in the world which is changing and my my the one i have in my head is uber you know you need the app to get an uber and certainly um in my little bubble of london 
the number of people I know who are getting Ubers rather than tubes and buses and stuff and normal taxis is absolutely huge. And so you have to have that app. So it's not like their app is any better than a competitor. The industry of taxis has been fundamentally shifted and there's an app for that as well. In fact, oddly enough, this morning, um, I have a cleaner who comes in the morning before we do the, uh, do the show and she finished and she had to go into her app and say, finish, this is how much I've been paid, this is how I've been paid, you know, sort of ticking off the various things that the app requires. That all goes back to the main cleaning company and they record that. So I'm not saying, obviously, that's a popular app, obviously, but um, it was just interesting to see that that's the way in which she interacts with her cleaning company and, and they've got an app for that as well. So that's probably the future of independent developers then, getting short-term contracts for companies like that who need an app for their staff that's not going to have mass appeal it's it's just going to be used by a few employees but it is crucial to making their business run yeah absolutely yeah i mean the the other area of apps which is obviously expanding is ad blockers and things now these maybe aren't necessarily apps in themselves but you know things that which are being bolted onto the back end of web browsers and what have you. And, and the next story is about the fact that the number of um, ad blockers which are on the mobile market has exploded. So I think there was a general perception that there was a lot of ad blockers going on with the standard desktop. And the numbers in this report is that there's sort of 200 million desktop users um, using ad blockers. But there's actually sort of 400 million smartphone users with ad blockers. And that's one in every five smartphones. Now, they've broken it down by by region and China, India, Indonesia and Pakistan are just wiping the floor with anyone else. Um, you know, when it comes to North America, Europe, Russia, things like this, they're in the they're in the sort of less than five million um, people in the population. Whereas China's at 160 million, India's at 122 million. So these developing markets are really taking to mobile ad blockers like like nothing in the West. Yeah, I saw one in five smartphones and I thought, what? No way. Until I saw the statistics that, okay, it's not in the West. This is China and India, a market that I know absolutely nothing about. And that was a real surprise to me because it's quite hard unless you root your phone to get decent ad blocking and hardly anyone roots their phone. So I, I was just very surprised by this whole statistic. No, I, w I wouldn't be having that. I mean, partly the actual reason obviously is because bandwidth mobile data is very very expensive and limited in some of these places but it isn't that difficult to be honest because we're talking about browsers with uh, ad blockers built in uh, for a large proportion of this so it's is it uc browser um, yeah 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 which comes with it built in i mean i use lightning on my phone rather than chrome and that's got a uh, ad blocker built in as well so there's no routing here required Okay, I think more of kind of phone-wide ad blocking, which means you have to edit your host file, which you could either do manually with root or just with something like Adway. But I suppose, yeah, a browser with it built in um, is, is a different story. But then again, people are supposed to be using apps for everything, aren't they? So they're still seeing adverts there. Yeah, something I'd be interested in knowing about, if we've got any listeners in that part of the world, is how prevalent it is to have pretty easily unlocked phones because I know that AOSP is widely used in the Chinese market and people don't actually use Google services at all. Uh, there are alternative app stores out there and devices that come off the shelves with a totally different shell, obviously, but based on AOSP. So whether it is a lot easier to get to things like uh, messing around with your host file, I'd be interested to know about. Well, going back to Joe's point about being surprised at the one in five and, you know, looking at the, the numbers, it was, was where you sort of found that realisation more more tangible. I, first of all, thought of, well, if iOS has come out with uh, ad blocking as standard out the box, of course it's one in five. I mean, that's been rolled out now, hasn't it? Well, it's not as standard, it's just as an option. Okay, I thought it'd come out with uh, Safari or whatever on the on the phone as standard blocking apps. In which case, you know, that is a huge number of uh, users in the West as well. Well, advertising is something we talk about very frequently on the show, so I think we'll park this discussion there for now and move on. And let's talk about little devices, and specifically the BBC Microbit. And we've talked about it on previous shows, but really the reason for bringing it up again today is that not only will it be given out to a whole tranche of school kids in the UK for free, now, those of us well past our early teens will also be able to get hold of one. And for £13, which places it somewhere between a Pi Zero and a full-blown Raspberry Pi 3, 
which seems a little bit pricey to me, but I suppose it's not too bad. Yeah, the £13 one, you can have to go to a supplier like Pimeroni. Um, Farnell are the sort of big player here, but they're only selling bulk pre-orders, and it is all pre-orders at the moment. You can't actually physically get hold of one. Um, but as I say, if you're stocking up a classroom or something, go to Farnell, otherwise Pimeroni. Yeah, and it's uh, roughly the same price as a code bug, which has got roughly the same functionality in it. So I think it, they've probably priced it in just about right. And I think it is going to do very, very well. I think there are going to be a lot of people who just love to buy new toys and have all the kind of different boards and everything. And I think that there's going to be people who are trying to teach kids more about coding with it. But Microsoft's heavy involvement concerns me, to say the least. But I don't know, the the more things out there that kids can play with and learn about coding, the better, I suppose. But mm, I'd just like to see more emphasis on um, software freedom, really. So I think there was the same sort of discussion when the Raspberry Pi came out as to there might be a few tinkerers who who want to just have the board and, and you know, the collectors, if you will, and there'll be the children who are using it. But over time, I think we can agree that the Raspberry Pi has become not just tinkerers, but you know, normal, uh, less sort of hackery kind of people are using them to get little things done here and there for spy cameras. And there's loads of things on the internet that you can try uh, different things with the Raspberry Pi. So it's very, very versatile. And that's really where it has exploded. You know, hundreds and thousands of them are being sold. I just can't see how that sort of, that area of people uh, like us and our listeners would actually want one of these BBC micro bits. I I have not heard a viable, justifiable reason that I'd want one of these. Cause it seems, you know, it's very different from the Pi. You couldn't really compare them. But it doesn't do anything useful like the Pi does. So have either of you got an argument as to why you might, you know, I might want to buy one? Well, sitting here watching the football on mute with a Raspberry Pi 3 using OpenELEC makes your point, doesn't it, that there are so many different uses for the Raspberry Pi, whereas personally, I can't really make an argument for why I would buy one, and that's why I haven't bought one of these um, BBC Micro Bits, because I don't have the time to learn to code, and it, it can't do much beyond that. So, yeah, I think you're right that it's not going to be as successful as the Pi, because it's not a multi-purpose computer like the Pi is. I mean, especially the Raspberry Pi 3 now. I mean, you can run a viable desktop on it. It's a bit slow and everything, but you, you can do that. You can do multimedia with it. You, you've got the GPIO stuff. You've got the coding. There's just so much you can do with it. Whereas this thing is it's very single purpose or, well, it's not single purpose. There are a few things you can do with it, but it's much less multi-purpose. If you want to try any of those multi-purpose things, then... I should point out it's available in various kit bundles as well with uh, add-on boards and bits and bobs. Well, let's move on to the Investigatory Powers Bill, which has passed through the House of Commons in the UK and just needs to go through the Lords now. So it's looking like it's definitely going to happen. And some people, I think, were a little bit surprised by how little opposition Labour gave to this. They basically said, don't spy on our trade unions and then we'll we'll back it which was uh, some people are saying is a little bit spineless. No doubt you would agree with that, Paddy. But let's face it, what we're talking about here is a legislative framework for what's already happening. You know, they're, they're basically just putting a mandate to say that all the stuff that we've been doing is now legal and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, there was nothing we could do about it before. So I don't know, color me cynical, but this makes absolutely no difference to anyone ever. I think you're right. But in a way, I was somewhat surprised by how little press this has had. And I mean, all of the press in the UK at the moment is taken over with the Brexit. We're having a referendum in this country at the moment to decide whether we're going to stay in the EU or not. And that seems to be grabbing all the headlines. But this is, if we're not being cynical, and if we're seeing this as new legislation for new powers, it is a huge thing. And you would have thought it would be front page everywhere, and it hasn't been. What, like the uh, Tory election fraud that is just completely absent from any mainstream media that's mysterious that one isn't it <laughs> yeah very mysterious do you think it is being hidden from us then or is it just a case of people just don't really care it's it not going to sell papers or make people click things because they, they just expect it and everyone's cynical like i am 
I think largely people do expect it. I mean, this has been one of the wonderful things about the Snowden revelations for governments around the world. Um, nothing explosive enough came out quickly enough to actually force any change. And all it's done is actually normalise a culture of people expecting to be spied upon. And therefore, I think it's been immensely counterproductive. And that's one of the reasons why I guess you see people of a very suspicious bent thinking that perhaps the whole thing was a setup in the first place. <laughs> Normalisation, that's the word I was going to go for, yeah. It, it has just normalised the idea of government spying and stuff. And I don't know, maybe, maybe it was a put-up job, the whole Snowden thing. I, I personally don't think so, but they've certainly taken advantage of it, full advantage. All right, it sounds somewhat like we're drifting into very different podcast territory here. I mean, the moon landings did happen. Uh, Kennedy was shot. These, these sorts of things just need to go down in history. Uh, so I will, I will pull you back to uh, technology and computer talk. And we have discussed um, Lenovo and the Superfish problems where um, they were shipping various bits of uh, OEM software, um, bloatware, if you will, and it had a whole load of uh, holes in it and people were able to actually do have root privileges on, on the PCs. And research firm Geo Security have had a look at a number of different uh, manufacturers. Uh, so they've looked at Acer, Asus, Dell, HP and Lenovo and found that every single one had at least one security vulnerability that could have led to a full system compromise. And so these are all coming out of the bloatware. So, you know, pre-installed games or pre-installed music applications or, or funny web browsers that have search bars and things that filter your results or what have you and and the problem they sort of they also highlighted is the fact that all of these bits of software have updaters which you know just sort of hacked together to make sure that this NAF software that you don't want that uses all your RAM and your processes and things also gets updated and these updaters are very easy to exploit as well and reverse engineer and so even in fact add to the problem of having even more easy ways of of crippling your PC. It seems strange to me that someone would just buy a PC, turn it on, and start using it. Because it's just, I would never do that. Even if I intended to use Windows, which I do for a few things, making my music and whatever, I would never use a straight-up Windows installation with all the bloatware and everything. The first thing I do is wipe the hard disk or replace it with an SSD and and build up my OSs from scratch. So it just seems really alien to me that anyone would put up with this bloatware and i know most people i suppose would attempt to remove it and keep using the os as was but for me i just have no interest in in that for for all the reasons that you've just talked about there jesse but i mean you're you know you're unbelievably elite aren't you joe you're the absolute creme de la creme whereas your average guy has has bought the pc and gone oh look it comes with free ad ad blocker well, that's free for a year. I might as well use it for a year. And then after a year, go, well, that was clearly working well. I can't remember seeing very many adverts. I'll pay the £50 for the refresh or whatever. And maybe there's a, a DVD player. Oh, brilliant. I don't need to go and download one now. Or, oh, that saved me going to look for this, that and the other. And I agree, obviously, I would want a fresh install. I can't stand it when you have to wait five minutes for, for all the little background processes to boot up. And when you load a web page and it comes up a little, a little thing at the end of every single hyperlink saying, this is acceptable, this is acceptable, blum, blum, blum. Unbelievably annoying. But I'm saying this because I see my, my flatmate's laptop and it's got pre-installed things still on it. And I, you know, I, I do want to march in there and start kicking it over and, and, you know, whacking Linux on it or have you. But at the same time, I just need, you know, sometimes I just need to let them get on with it. And if he has any problems, we, you know, we deal with it. But I just, I, I do see it in normal use and people who have just bought a laptop and it, unless they really get in the way, they're not going to be removed, I don't think. We're sort of talking around this a bit. I mean, I guess the reason the OEMs install all this junk is because they make a very small amount of money out of it on top of selling the hardware. I mean, is the answer that the hardware is too cheap? Well, even if the hardware was more expensive, you would still be getting more money by putting the software on there, wouldn't you? So you're making free money, basically. Money for old rope. Yeah, I don't think that charging more would make it go away. And their margins are so small and the market's shrinking to a point where they're just trying to do every little desperate thing they can to make some money out of it. And you're probably going to end up seeing more and more of these OEMs 
stopping making laptops. Sony have already done it, and maybe we'll get to a point where you can't even buy a mainstream laptop anymore, and you can only buy stuff from System76 and Entryware and that sort of thing. Because all they care about is the bottom line. And if the bottom line is zero or minus something, then they're just not going to do it, are they? Well, let's move it on, but stay with Windows. And Microsoft have added pseudo-terminal support to the Windows subsystem for Linux in the latest Insider Fastering build, uh, with the result that Ubuntu and Windows will now support applications like Tmux that actually require PTY support to function. And again, to me anyway, it looks as like they're taking the needs of developers really seriously here and attempting to give them an experience that's good enough to leave them happy with Windows as a platform to work on and not have to worry about trying to use Linux at all. Well, yeah, they're delivering slowly but surely on what they promised, and that is making it feel very much like you've got a terminal open on a proper Linux system. But that said... It- I keep coming back to this. Is it ever going to work quite as well? And I hope not. But with announcements like this, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they are going to just slowly implement each little feature and and perfect it and make it to a point where you don't need a Linux desktop if you're a developer. But one thing that you definitely don't need Windows for, and that's gaming. Uh, No, hang on, that doesn't work, does it? Oh, well, the number of Linux games has quadrupled in the past two years the number of independent small games that no one's really that interested in playing has quadrupled as far as I can see. Well, I've had some AAA titles like Tomb Raider and stuff. So I suppose any more games on Linux has got to be good news, hasn't it? Well, I think it started from a very small number. So quadrupling is is maybe not the most impressive thing. However, you know, it, it had like sort of 500 or so, as you say, when it started. And now two years later, there's just over 2000, which is all good. But like you touched on, a lot of them are these sort of weird little independent ones that are sort of five, 10 pounds. And they're not going to get the attention of the people who are playing PS4s or Xbox Ones or, or have got, you know, a gaming rig that has Windows on it. It's not going to pull them across because I didn't see when I looked recently very many of the big titles that I would want to play. I'm sort of surprised it hasn't done better, or maybe I just hoped it would do better. So because if this went well, the number of games were available, then invariably Steam machines would probably do well, and, and there'd be a an open source competitor in the market to both Windows and uh, the consoles. But they haven't done well, have they? Well, no, exactly. We sort of um, these two stories are a bit wrapped up, and there's a a look at how many of Valve Steam machines have been sold. Um, and it's a bit difficult to actually use numbers, but what they've looked at is that uh, half a million Steam controllers have been sold since uh, they launched in November. So that with that as a benchmark, you could say that maybe half a million Steam machines have been sold in half a year, which I think is a terrible uh, way of looking at it because, for example if you wanted to play with a friend or a flatmate or something, you'd need two controllers. If you wanted to use your own PC and have a Steam controller, that's not a Steam machine being sold. But even if you did assume that half a million is true, in the same time, the Xbox One sold five and a half million and the PS4 10 million. So, you know, they are orders of magnitude bigger than the Steam machine. And I don't think we've really heard very much. You know, I, there was a, the announcements of who was going to be making these dedicated boxes. But since then, they've sort of sort of petered out a bit. There's one very clear reason to me. Windows 10. I mean, the, the whole Steam OS and Steam on Linux thing came about because of Windows 8 and how terrible it was. Whereas Windows 10 has come out, and apart from privacy concerns and, you know, that kind of thing, in terms of usability, it's not a bad OS. And... So gamers have happily embraced it. So why would they need this other OS and the, these other machines when you can just build yourself a little box and run Windows on it? So so the reason for that, and uh, this is, you didn't quite go the way I thought you would, but the reason that I thought Steam OS was going to you know was was made and was going to be this big thing was that while they knew Windows Ten was coming out, and like you say, Windows Ten is not anywhere near as horrible as Windows Eight there was a fear that it would really clamp down on the way you could sell games and it would very much be through the Microsoft Store. You wouldn't be able to buy the DVD and install it. You'd have to go through the store and a lot of developers wouldn't like that. So Steam and and Valve, sorry, were really keen that they would be the place that developers would go to sell their games on PCs. But it doesn't seem to have turned out that way. You can just 
install things on Windows 10 as easily as you could on, you know, Windows 95, Windows XP. So it, the the sort of raison d'etre for people using Steam over Windows hasn't really come about. Yeah, that was my understanding as well. And before we started recording, I went and looked at the hardware survey from Steam, from Valve, and that says that just 0.8% of Steam users actually run Linux, uh, about 95.5% are on Windows and 3.5% on OS X. And of Windows, um, Windows 10 actually tops the list at the moment, 64-bit Windows 10. So obviously the users are quite happy using it, whether or not Valve was very happy with the situation or not. Yeah, and supposedly Windows 10 is going to be the last version. It's just going to roll from now on. So hopefully for people who are using it, they won't lock it down and, and make you only install through their, their app store. And so yeah, maybe SteamOS is just doomed to history. Yeah, just before we move on, a question for you two, because obviously Steam isn't proper open source. I mean, the client, as I understand, is proprietary. And I saw another news story in the week about uh, Slack being down. And Slack's another proprietary service that a lot of people in the open source world seem very excited about for whatever reason. And ditto with Telegram. And it's just kind of got me thinking, I just wonder what your opinion was, why some of these proprietary products garner so much enthusiasm within the FOSS crowd who would normally be sort of spitting feathers about things like that. Well, why doesn't Joe use um, WhatsApp? I do now. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you so, two have made me. So if we, if we rewind uh, a couple of months, Joe wasn't using WhatsApp. And for my understanding, it's because it was basically owned by Facebook and there was a negative connotations with Facebook. Is that fair? Yeah, and also I'm a hipster as well. Yeah, exactly. So Telegram came out and it doesn't have a big, you know, a horrible, evil company, whatever you want. And so there was some discussions, uh, actually at OddCamp, about which one had better encryption and, and things like this. But putting that to one side, it is almost sort of like a mindshare thing. Now, is there a good open source equivalent, like truly open source from um, server to client and on, across all the different platforms that is an option? Or do you just have to pick the lesser of a number of evils? And I think that's that's my answer is that um, Steam and um, Telegram and the other one you mentioned there are the lesser of the evils to get things that you want to do done or, or play games or whatever it might be. The other one I mentioned there was Slack and there is an alternative to Slack. It's called IRC. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree, Jesse, yeah. It is just a case of the the lesser of all of the evils. It's the best thing that we've got. It's the the most open source or the closest to or the least evil in, in most of those cases. And that's why people embrace them. I think also you've got to take into account usability. I mean, we could all be using Ubuntu phones. We could all be uh, using F-Droid. But at some point, just fundamental usability of what we're used to does come into these things. Mm. I think I have to send RMS around to have a word with you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway then, let's wrap up the news with a good news story because I like doing that. And we're talking about Mozilla's open source support program previously. And they've just announced that $500,000 from that program will be allocated to what they've cunningly called the SOS Fund, which apparently stands for the Secure Open Source Fund. And the idea is that this fund will be used to pay for security code audits. And Mozilla have offered to help remedy any problems found. And the code then will be audited again by an external party who really should be trying to identify that all the issues previously flagged up have been dealt with adequately. And three projects have already been through this process, um, those being the Perl Compatible Regular Expression Library, LibJPEG Turbo, and PHP MyAdmin. Which was well overdue, wasn't it? <laughs> it was slightly, yes. <laughs> um, Mozilla are pitching this fund as being complementary to other programs, so things like the Core Infrastructure Initiative, it sees that very much as an adjunct to that. So I guess it's really a welcome development all around. Yeah, we like to bag on Mozilla, but I think credit where it's due, this is just 100% positive, isn't it? This is them doing some good, and I don't think even the most cynical of people like us can find anything bad with it. So yeah, thumbs up. Well done, Mozilla. On to the feedback then. And first of all, a huge thanks to our new monthly supporter, Alternative Armies Southwest. That's a very interesting name. Uh, I'm not even going to bother speculating about that. 
And of course, to our existing monthly supporters, some of whom have changed their credit card or the credit card has expired recently. And so I don't know exactly how it works with PayPal, but if your credit card expires, then it kind of cancels your automatic payments. So there are a few people who had subscribed previously and it, the the transactions are not happening every month. So if that's happening to you, um, we'd appreciate it if you wouldn't mind looking into it. And contact details, which were inexplicably in Comic Sans on my phone, but thankfully not here. Um, you can email us, show at linuxluddites.com. Or if you go to the website, you'll find links to the Twitter, which is at Linux Luddites, and Google Plus and Facebook communities. Or you can always leave a comment under each show. Now, as, as Paddy mentioned at the top of the show, this is our sort of first, as our normal feedback. And then later on, we're going to have a, a separate one solely for all of the net neutrality. But for, before we get into this one, just a, a quick point that we did have a few listeners write in on the last show saying that the MP3 feed wasn't working properly. Paddy's made some clever coding solutions and, and looked into it. And, and I know we've definitely solved uh, one of those. We haven't heard back as to whether there was some different issue. But um, if you're having problems with the download, let us know. And, uh, you know, it's either our end or maybe your app that we can uh, make changes. So so we'll try and make sure that everyone gets gets the show, obviously. So on with the feedback proper, and uh, regular listener Phelan Whiteley wrote in. He said, When using Windows, the greatest productivity waste of time I have to put up with in a client site was updates. To this day, I wonder how anyone is taking the update process as professional. Even in a corporate network with an update server, they are painful to download, install, and often require three reboots in a row. As sorry, as someone who works in that sort of environment, I have exactly that as well, so I, I know your pain. Absolute nuts, he says. It is not professional OS in this respect. I've had machines force reboots whilst running tests in VMs. It's crazy to think an OS can't recognise a machine that has no one sitting in it whilst it pops up the your machine will reboot in 10 minutes message. I've literally lost days of work over several months. And PS, I will be switching to Nextcloud. I think that's a very fair point. I, I sometimes have to deal with Windows machines for people and updates. Oh, it is just such a nightmare. I've often tweeted about it saying things like why can't it just be as simple as a couple of commands and a reboot you know you install a fresh linux system even a relatively old one and you know the the number of updates and the, the connection speed and stuff will obviously determine how long that is but at least it's transparent at least you know what it's doing whereas with windows it's just a dark art sometimes it'll say there's no updates available and then you refresh again five minutes later and there's 50 and you do them, and then there's another three, and then oh, it's just terrible. I, I don't know how anyone can run Windows, probably just for that one fact alone. Which makes you think, actually, this move away from traditional package managers to containerization and stuff, does that mean that updates are going to be less straightforward on Linux? I really hope not. I would hope that because we've become so ingrained with the way that package managers allow us to update, they will work out a way of keeping that sort of uh, user interface system and then just make sure that the back end does all its magic jiggery pokery. And I know we've discussed about, as maybe a little bit off topic, but we've discussed about um, having these snap packages and things. And how do you update each one if there's a, a library or what have you which has got some sort of vulnerability and you need to update them all you know is there a way the os can crack them open and, and change that one library to remove the security vulnerability or does it have to wait for whoever made that to update it all um and anyway so that's that's a slightly different topic but as i said in in the in reading out Phelim's post there it was i've had exactly these things we go round and round and reboot and there's a a comical moment where he had a, a huge presentation going on and the guy was just about to start from our company and the little pop-up comes up saying in five minutes this will reboot obviously it's an it thing but they've they've made it so you have no choice so we all sat there like 200 people in this presentation <laughs> waiting for him to reboot his machine because he had no choice but to wait for it yeah it's just shambolic to be fair but let's move away from windows a little bit and we were talking about cryptomator last time and martin got in touch and said hi all i've been working to develop a way of backing up and encrypting data for myself and so was extremely interested in your recent shows considering the subject for data encryption, your description of Cryptomator sounds very similar to a package I use called VeraCrypt. And for backup, I have used Free File Sync for some time now, which works well. I've chosen these as they're both available for Linux and Windows, 
which I have to use for work. Just some other options for you and the Luddite listeners to consider. My next challenge, of course, is to explore Paddy's solution. Now, before we talk about anything else, I was really a little bit surprised listening back to the show. I'd forgotten you pitched this as a backup solution, Joe, a uh, cryptomator, because it certainly wasn't how I viewed it at the time I was sort of looking at it. Well, it's kind of a key aspect to backups. It's a key stage in your backup solution. So I suppose I shouldn't have pitched it as a complete backup solution, but it's certainly one of the steps that you will take, surely, if you're backing up to someone else's computer, the cloud. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, sorry. I'm probably not making myself clear. I mean, say, listening back to the show, it it sounded as if we were pitching Cryptomator as part of a backup process, whereas I think it's more just a mechanism for storing your day-to-day work files in an encrypted format on a, on a cloud service um, as opposed to a backup service. Now, I think files that are in use on a frequent basis uh, are just as usable with Cryptomator as, as sort of sleeping, resting uh, backup files, if you like. It wasn't something, to say, I noticed at the time we were talking about it, but it, it certainly hit me afterwards that perhaps we'd pitched it slightly wrongly. Well, it not only hit you, but it also hit Will. And uh, at the end of this one, he he comments on that. So Will said, uh, I've used InkFS in the past, but stopped after the security audit, not because of the findings of the security audit, but more because it led me to look into the development of InkFS, and I realized it was not robust. For example, development was actually suspended for about a year, and even now, the issues from the security audit have not been addressed and development is slow. More recently, I've used Git Annex, which can work with many cloud storage services and use GPG to encrypt files. Cryptomator looks very slick and I look forward to testing it out, but I'd love to see a serious security audit of it as well. I take slight issue with calling it a backup solution. It could be part of a backup strategy, but it does not have some features such as versioning, protection from deleting files, etc. that I'd want in a full backup program. So that that was just uh, given that we were discussing how it wasn't maybe pitched quite there he does sort of clarify some of the things he would expect in you know a, a full backup program that you get in pre-installed with linux mint and things well changing topic completely popey said what of the week has to go to joe Ressington for saying he considers indiegogo a less dodgy place than kickstarter that surprised me i always thought everyone considered indiegogo to be the dodgy one given people can create projects which get funding even if their goal isn't met there's certainly way more unicorns, skyhooks, and perpetual motion machines on Indiegogo, in my experience. And I replied to him saying, mm, yeah, maybe he's right, actually. Maybe it was just my perception had been colored by... Recently, there's been a few high-profile Kickstarters that have not delivered, and the company's gone bust, and everyone's just lost their money. Whereas the only time I've ever used Indiegogo was for Linux Voice, and they delivered exactly what they said they would. So yeah, maybe he's right, and they are a bit dodgy. I had originally thought that Indiegogo was set up so that, as he said, even if you don't meet your funding campaign, you can get the money. But we had that corrected, and and that is just one of the options you can set up, whereas other ones are, if you don't hit your target, you get nothing. Yeah, it's just a bit more flexible than Kickstarter, where you have to get all your money. I really don't see the point in the one that you can, let's say you get half the money, because obviously you should have budgeted for why you need all that money, whether it be for a particular machine or press or there's a minimum order value or something. And then to get half the money, kind of what you're expected to deliver it, even though you don't have the money, to, to it just seems a very odd option in my opinion. Yeah, it is actually when you think about it. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't back things with flexible funding campaigns. But Popey also said, on the subject of Tizen watches, Jesse figured Tizen on watches might not integrate with Android well, as it's not Android Wear. He should try a Pebble watch, which also fits into the not Wear category, where Tizen resides. Where where was the cha-ching, Joe? (laughs) Yes, well, I was going to get to that. Uh, With Pebble, you can optionally install the Android Wear app on your phone, which gives your Pebble watch all kinds of features your Wear watch has. For example, you can interact with notifications using buttons on the Pebble. I'd imagine Samsung might do the same for Tizen watches, although it's entirely plausible they'll make their own S-apps equivalent, S-Wear maybe. And yeah, I forgot to say that. If you want to reply to notifications and stuff, you do have to install um, Android Wear. But I can't open Android Wear and do anything with it because I haven't got the Google app. So uh, it, it worked, and that's all I care about, really, even if it is evil proprietary software. But yeah, with these Tizen watches, he's right. If 
the Pebble, which is a totally independent company, can work really well with Android. There's no reason why Tizen can't. So I was of the opinion, and clearly, you know, I, I didn't know what I was talking about, but I was of the opinion that when you had Android Wear as an app on your phone, it would only talk to Android Wear watches. But it sounds like, there's, there's, is there an API that other people can hook into to allow the same notifications to be sent with the Android Wear app? Well, to get notifications, you don't actually need the Android Wear app. It's only extended functionality like replying to things. So there clearly are some APIs that anyone can use. Well, Keith followed up on Popey's comment and said, my Pebble Time still integrates quite well with my Android phones. Not only is it quite handy to have physical buttons to dismiss or mark the notifications as they come in, the voice replies even works shockingly well. And the steps and sleep data integrate seamlessly with Google Fit. That being said... And from what I've heard, Samsung has mostly indeed stuck to their S-nonsense, or at least they were doing so a generation or two ago. But if they've changed their mind, Android and Google's relevant services seem to be fairly open and agnostic when it comes to tying in with a smartwatch. So that all sounds pretty good, actually, because I clearly had uh, a very wrong idea as to how these things tied in with Android, and uh, especially with Joe now having a a, a good watch to, to play with and, and seeing it at the pub. It sounds like it doesn't need to be an Android Wear watch, and so maybe Samsung are right to be producing smartwatches that use Tizen. Yep, so that'll do it for this bit of the feedback. Let's move on. I'm sure we've all heard the phrase, all software has bugs. And I've got to say, it's one that really irritates me. Now, it's kind of moved from being a regrettable statement of fact uh, back when I was a, a wee whippersnapper to these days... Best said with a shrug, and worst case, worn as a badge of pride, I feel. And I think partly the change in attitude since I was younger is down to the use of online software delivery, which doesn't incur the costs associated with physically shipping box product. But I also wonder if modern open source development practices have not only caused more bugs and poor code to be developed, but also led to an increasing acceptance of the situation that all software has bugs. And I guess there are a couple of factors that are leading me to put this proposition forward, whether it's accurate or not. And the first is that incremental development done in the open uh, means that projects are never finished. So we always expect bugs to be present because there's going to be another version along in five minutes. And also the fact that projects often accept contributions from coders all over the world who are varying levels of competency. And this means there's frequently no consistency at all in code quality. So as I said at the top of the show, I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here, but I also feel there's a nugget of truth in what I'm suggesting. What do you guys think? I think the word is competence and not competency for a start. <laughs> but I think you're right to a certain extent that because it's all in the open, it, it's never finished. There's never really a, a proper deadline. I think with Linux distros, that's a little bit different because especially things like Ubuntu, which have a, a firm release date, that is the date at which they are effectively finished. But then again, I suppose you expect to get updates down the line. They they will ship. I mean, I remember Zubuntu having terrible power issues and, you know, blank screen and all kinds of stuff. And I suppose they shipped it and just thought, well, we'll push some updates down the line. But I mean, is it really any different with proprietary software? No, I'm not necessarily arguing that proprietary applications developed better if you like, which isn't a very fine use of the English language, than open source ones. Although I guess that you could make that argument because they have fewer releases. I mean, things are generally worked on and then pushed out and they're not done on such a frequent basis as open source, which is kind of grab it and build it anytime you fancy. And also, I guess, for proprietary apps, you could argue that frequently the teams are managed in a slightly different way and things like code structure and quality is more rigorously enforced because there is a standard that everyone has to work to. Whereas in the open source world, we are used to accepting contributions from people and not rewriting them into a standard format and what have you. What about the throw over the wall method, like with Android? Do you think that that ultimately ends up with higher quality code? I think for Android, it probably does for the reasons I've just stated, that it is a specific team of people working on it within a certain environment, not accepting outside contributions. But surely you must get situations where a complete outsider will contribute something of real value. Oh, undoubtedly. But that doesn't mean that the 
a multiple other contributions that are also a bit ropey for that one piece that is of good value. But then you just need good management, surely. Like, you know, you need a strong management figure like Torvalds who, you know, won't put up with poor quality code. Absolutely. And I think we know that the kernel is managed in quite a different way from how an awful lot of other open source projects are. And I'm not trying to tie everyone with the same brush here. And as I said up front, I am playing devil's advocate to some degree, although I think there is some truth in the proposition I'm putting forward. I mean, there are a lot of projects out there that do take contributions from anyone that don't have a strong leadership structure in place. Um, and even down to things like forking, I mean, that happens on a reasonably infrequent basis. But it's all part of the culture, if you like, of the open source world where the code is just there and supposedly the code is king and people can take it and run with it. And having multiple contributors and multiple versions of the same thing, if you like, don't add to the code stability and the long-term bug freeness of it. I wonder how much this is down to the size of the teams writing the code and, as Joe touched on, the management of those teams. I, For example, if you had a particular application, there's only two or three people working on it and it's open source, you're a lot less likely to have um, the time and effort to go through some sort of Q&A process, some sort of management process. And the QA is really sort of what I'm taking away from this initial sort of talk was that thinking if I, you know, if I write a document or do a calculation at work, it goes through uh, a low level checker, a high level checker, it gets approved, reviewed, signed off before it even goes out to the client. It, you know, it goes through a whole load of checks and balances. Whereas if I was just going to, you know, send you guys a, a for some reason a calculation I'd done, I wouldn't get all that QA done. I, I would just send it to you and assume I'm right. But it does require a lot of time, effort, and a very fixed sort of rigid working procedures that have to be enforced. And those are only enforced because if I don't do it that way, my calculations don't go out and, you know, I don't get paid, basically. So it's, it's, it's not fun to do that stuff. And so I think this is probably where it is. You get, you get small groups of people want to do something for the love of it. And, this, you know, the QA is not the fun part to do. Whereas the bigger the organization, whether that be open source or proprietary, will enforce that. And the management will say this has to be done this way, which is where you get Ubuntu coming out with far fewer bugs than most open source projects. I don't think I agree with you, to be honest. Um Formal processes, yeah, you need in a large organization or a large structure. Um, and I think we see that both in the commercial world and also in large open source projects. But also I think small teams can be very effective as long as they're competent teams. I must stress that um, because they take pride in their work. And one of the side effects of what I'm talking about here, I think, is that they're, I don't know, I, I can see a lack of pride from some projects and I think that is partly because of what I was suggesting that the idea of having bugs is totally acceptable these days. And if it's acceptable, then you don't make that much effort to do anything about it. And I think the real problem is in medium sized teams where you do have a lot of outside contributors and there aren't the formal processes. And it's kind of a double whammy that means you end up with really shoddy code. I mean, in the intro chat, I made a couple of notes, and one of those is whether there's a hodgepodge of inputs, which is this problem. As you said, a lot of open source software is happy to have contributions from multiple people across the globe, and I don't know quite what the process for getting on board with a project is or what what, what they do to make sure you're able to code in a particular way. But there will be, even if there's, even if everyone is a good coder, there will be different styles of coding. There will be different um, shortcuts or ways that you can do things. And if you have all these different people and you're, you have this disparate group, it's going to be difficult to get one person to overview it because it is so different. And I mean, I, I don't say there's a solution to this, but is this, do you think, another one of the problems where you get just different ways of doing things, whereas maybe in uh, companies where everyone's sat together, there is an agreed methodology for this is the way we code. Yeah, I do, to be honest. And I think the idea of uh, code styles and also methodologies for doing things, like whether you use for loops or while loops or even something simple, simple as that, is sometimes not looked very favorably upon by people from the open source world because we have this sort of freewheeling, we're all 
superstars and we can all do what we want and we should be able to do things in the way we like. And that doesn't necessarily make for a well-manufactured product at the end of the day. I want to see fundamentally it has to come back to this QA problem where, you know, it, it's got to go through testing. And even if you've got poor code, you can bang on it many, many times. And eventually you will have ironed out all the bugs or gone through all the various parameters you can possibly have in which that code could be used, obviously discounting any sort of future changes in hardware or, or software, what have you. But is there ways in which that can be banged on by open source projects without them having to have management teams or a, a separate um, sort of white room team who look at the code afresh. You know, there are ways in which you can thrash it through various scenarios, but are they maybe not up to scratch? Is that is that where we should be putting our resources? Personally, I don't think so, to be honest, because my basic premise is here is that Stuff like QA, I mean, it's really important, and but it's an end of the day. It's a remediation measure, if you like. I mean, it's part of the whole development process, but the development process ought to start with coders who are really proud of their code and don't accept that the premise all software has bugs has to be true, and they ought to be striving for it not to be true, and it's something I'm not seeing at the moment. You were talking about code style there, and a question that I really feel that I've got to ask you uh tabs versus spacing where do you stand paddy um tabs and i know that's not a popular answer but <laughs> but that's partly because of file size bloat and that's because i come from a an old coding habit where it did actually matter how much space you use in your files and also it's really easier for an editor to actually expand tabs out to any number of spaces whereas if you hard code spaces in it's got a bit more work to do to reformat things for you but as I say, I know it's not a popular thing and people like using spaces these days. Fair enough. Just wanted to know. So it seems that the the problem that you've described here, Paddy, has got a fairly simple solution. I say fairly simple. You need to have decent management of the contributions that you get. You need to have decent quality code and you need to be not afraid to tell people politely when their code is not up to scratch. And you need to take your time and make sure that the software is ready to be released when you release it. Yeah, I think they're large contributory factors to making better products at the end of the day. I think the release thing is important. I think having fixed milestones and not shoving out point releases every month and having code constantly rebuilt is also it would be a great step forward. I mean, we were talking about the Mozilla thing earlier in the news and one of the things that struck me about that story was not only are they going to provide services to projects that are actively maintained, but it is going to be a very much a point in time thing. So they're going to go through this whole process and help fund uh, work to discover bugs and get them fixed. But at that point, the code will continue to be developed and more features will be added and consequently more bugs will be added. It's not saying, okay, this is now going to be fixed for five years and it's just going to be out there as it is and we know it works and that's how the whole open source ecosystem tends to work it's constant churn it's constant change it's constant introduction of bugs and it just doesn't make me very happy if you're picking up on that well i get the feeling that the listeners out there will have a few opinions of their own on this so i do get in contact to share them that's exactly what a lot of people did when we talked about net neutrality last time so uh let's cover that feedback now so let's start with Stephen. And he said, I think the net neutrality discussion was missing the point most of the time by casting it in terms of the consumer. The major issue is select content providers getting preferential treatment, particularly when the internet provider is itself a content provider and offers its content at a discount relative to third parties. We want to avoid getting stuck with legacy monopolies who prevent a new competitor from even being able to have a go because of the preferential deals. Now, Eric also wrote in and echoed Stephen's initial point there. And he actually continued saying, because the ISPs serve content, there is a conflict of interest for them, as there is a desire for those monopolies to suppress the growth of competing video services such as Amazon and Netflix. Some have argued that there was never network neutrality in the past, so we don't need it in the future. But in the past, the business models of our telecommunications and media monopolies weren't being threatened by the internet. 
With the rise of cord cutting and the younger generation abandoning the old business model for selling television entertainment, the monopolies are looking to extort money from Google, Amazon, Netflix to make up for those lost revenue from people dropping paid TV. The only way, without network neutrality, that we can prevent the incumbent ISP and media monopolies from abusing their position is to strictly enforce antitrust regulations and bust up the vertical integration of American ISPs and the media. If we eliminate network neutrality and all streaming companies start paying money to ISPs, then the majority of internet traffic now becomes a fast lane. Will people see their internet bills go down because companies like Netflix are now paying the ISPs? I think everyone knows the answer to that question. So this is something that we didn't really touch on, and I feel that we did miss, didn't we? The fact that, particularly in America, you're getting these mergers happening where the content providers are also the companies providing your connection to the internet. And so there's a massive conflict of interest there. Well, let me put my devil's advocate horns back on again. You say there's a massive conflict of interest. I mean, surely it's just businesses trying to make money as best they can. And if they want to do that, that's up to them. Well, that would be okay if you had a choice of loads of different ISPs. And I, living in London, am very lucky that I've got fiber that I can have. Or if I wanted DSL, then there are a myriad companies that I could go with. Whereas my understanding is that in a lot of America, that's simply not the case. You In each area, you pretty much, you've got one ISP. And so it's not like you can say, well, I don't like what they're doing. I'm going to go with someone else. You're basically stuck using one company. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, Eric himself sort of voiced what to do about that. I mean, he says that the only way to prevent them abusing their position is to strictly enforce antitrust regulations and bust them up. And that is the only way to do it. And all this nonsense about um, cuddling people and trying to enforce net neutrality is sort of approaching the problem from the wrong direction. If you've got trust antitrust issues and monopoly issues, then they should be dealt as antitrust issues and monopoly issues. And we shouldn't be sort of saying, okay, you can maintain your monopoly, but you've got to do these nice little things for us as well. I mean, that doesn't solve the problem at the end of the day at all. But even in this country, we have companies who serve you as an ISP and serve you uh, video and things like this. So uh, Virgin, for example, Virgin Media, they, they, you know, give you internet and they also give you telephone and video and tv and what have you so we have these big mergers in this country but we also have many independent isps and i just it seems odd that we have both without having any kind of rules that say you must only serve data or you must only serve um tv or or video what have you I, i it's disappointing that America hasn't got to the same position we are. But I also think that maybe we should bring in rules that say you could do one or the other to prevent us from going to a position where, you know, we have monopolies or duopolies. Yeah, I mean, the market's developed here quite differently. And part of that, I think, is down to the local loop and bundling that we went through quite a few years back. But the other big problem for the states, and it's not one that's frequently talked about, is the role of government and local government in this, because they have in many places, actively stopped the introduction of alternative services. And they're actually permitting monopolies and duopolies to continue in those locations to the detriment of the customer. And, I mean, that's not a problem for the ISPs, for the big providers out there. I mean, they're being actively supported by government who is being funded by them. I mean, you've got a really corrupt system going on there of political funding, and that is at the root of an awful lot of this. And what about Google? I mean, they're coming along and banging in all these super high-speed fibers and stuff. And, okay, it's only in select select cities. But it sounds like where they are doing it, it's really being disruptive, which surely can only be a good thing. Absolutely. And Google only getting access to markets because of their close relationship with the Obama administration, I guess. So it'll be different once Trump gets in then. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've agreed not a political show. Yeah, I'm pleased Joe's come around <laughs> to my opinion, though. <laughs> For the record, I do not believe that Trump will get in. I still believe that Hillary's going to win. Anyway, Dridi Bukumun said, I must react to this non-debate you had on net neutrality. It's not about traffic shaping. It's about traffic discrimination. Of course, ISPs have more customers than they can get through the pipe, at least for the theoretical maximum throughput. So their networks regularly suffer congestion. I dare say, if you don't fight congestion using at least traffic shaping, you're a terrible ISP. 
The problem is not to regulate the pipe. The problem is when you start shaping services. The point that Jesse fails to make is that ISPs want to make tons of money too. Because, of course, from their point of view, it's unfair that people make money on top of the access they sell. And for what it's worth, services are orders of magnitude more profitable than infrastructure. So how do you make money from people making money? That's easy. You make them pay for protection. I mean, yeah, I think it's fair to say that you couldn't possibly put in the infrastructure that guaranteed that everyone had their absolute maximum at all times of the day and night, because... Hang it, on, hang on, that's what you were arguing last time out. <laughs> I was asking, arguing that last time out. This traffic shaping, we've had a couple of people write in, and I have to say, it does kind of make some sense on the traffic shaping <laughs> point of view. <laughs> Which is why it was good to have feedback. It's good to have this this fourth person on the show who can who can write in and give us some you know some other opinions. Anyway, sorry I interrupted you. Go on, carry on with your point. Well, well I mean, let, let me just go through um, Phelan Whiteley, who also wrote in, and, and these are the sort of two that that cover this topic. Um, so Phelan said. I believe the correct definition of being neutral is all types of the same traffic are equal, not that all traffic is equal and you can't traffic shape. So high priority traffic of, say, voice over IP would all be equal, but it would get higher priority than all HTTP. So a particular ISP can't prioritize their VoIP over competitors. Amazon Video would be equal to Netflix, etc. I have no problem with quality of service as long as the categorizations all have equal right within their own kind. ISPs need to be beaten with sticks for the asterisk shenanigans they get up to. Unlimited, that has a limit, one gigabyte a second, as long as you use unicorn horn shielded pairs, people should know what they're getting. So I, I guess Phelan there has a, some issues with some of the small caveats. But I, I agree with this idea that perhaps, well, while traffic shaping implies that you could do it however you like, the idea of saying, right, all video must have the same bandwidth and shaping associated with it all voice over ip all uh, standard web pages must have the same shaping no matter where it's come from or who's serving it well that sounds perfectly reasonable doesn't it if you can genuinely treat all of the the same traffic equally but then you know sometimes things like torrents for example you would think well torrents are almost exclusively used for i don't know downloading game of thrones or you know, other copyright infringing material like that. Whereas the reality is that the the torrent protocol is a very good and tried and tested method for transferring large amounts of data. So you've got cases like Linux ISOs, or, you know, sometimes programs that are built on top of that protocol. And so it's it's not as straightforward as that, potentially. It's not, but I would agree with Phelium if I was going to endorse any form of network neutrality or even any definition of network neutrality, then the one that Phelium's put forward is exactly the spot on correct one. And it's got to be on quality of service for particular types of service. I mean, even in the IP headers, I mean, there was a, a field called TOS um, for type of service, which got repurposed for the differentiated services field a little while later, which was designed exactly for flagging up how important a particular type of traffic was. And if there could be some agreement over where these various services fit into that, like voice and video, then it would be relatively easy to implement. It's just no one can actually agree how to do this and will agree amongst themselves to actually honour it. Yeah, you'd need some sort of internet governing group. I don't know, maybe the the people who allow the dot coms and the orgs and all that kind of stuff to define what is what what has priority. And you know, we did get a number of people writing in about the hospital example, and you know, how would you prioritize that? I mean, there wouldn't obviously be the definition of medical priority of of, of any kind of data, but it it does make you wonder how you would rate it why should i get a slower web page just because the guy next to me is viewing netflix for example yeah i seem to remember one of those comments being along the lines of my point about least lines being correct wasn't it you mean did that get dropped from the feedback yeah i noticed that 
<laughs> so so I, I do have to apologize we got absolutely loads of feedback on this and we've had you know we had to do a double feedback segment on this show and there were really good points that I've, I've cut down everyone's that we've read so far and have had to remove people's entirely just to get it down to a so we can fit it in the podcast and not have an entire feedback section. So I apologize for the, the chopping and everything. And I tried to be as neutral as possible, but <laughs> some things came and some things went. Go on then, let's wrap things up with Will. And he's pointing out something totally different here. And Will said, for most of your discussion, it seemed like the real issue you were talking about was a pricing problem rather than the content neutrality problem. The pricing model of internet service reminds me of some cloud storage services that offer unlimited storage. ISPs should charge variable amounts that matches their varying costs. That is, more per bandwidth at 8pm, less at 3am. But of course, that would be too complicated for most consumers to understand. However, most other issues would work themselves out if price and cost were properly coupled. Yes, he had gone to explain in his his full email about how uh, there is unlimited storage that obviously as soon as you actually start to use that limited storage and the reference of Microsoft they then cut it out and you couldn't have unlimited or there was a an Amazon backup that used tape drives and the actual cost of that when you tried to get your data back off of it which was the real cost was very expensive and it would be interesting to see if you were able to actually have the genuine cost of the moment at which you asked for that one megabyte of whatever it was versus a different time asking for that same megabyte. I mean, it'd be incredibly complicated to do and people generally quite like £30 a month, £40 a month. But it does seem like the only genuine way of doing it to say this is how much it is genuinely costing for you to watch Netflix at 7pm when everyone else is watching Netflix. Yeah, it's an interesting model. I think sort of policing it to make sure that customers aren't being fleeced would be the difficult bit because it's going to end up very much like sort of Uber surge pricing, isn't it, otherwise? Yeah, where they charge you more if your battery's nearly dead. That's (laughs) that's the one. Well, no doubt we're going to get another load of feedback about this. It seems to be a very hot topic. So do send it in, although we probably won't be covering it on the next show, I don't suppose. Jesse probably takes a sigh of relief there, not having to uh, (laughs) edit down loads of that. But uh, with that, we're coming to the end of another Linux Luddites. You can email us show at linuxluddites.com or find us on Twitter at Linux Luddites or the Google Plus and Facebook communities or leave a comment on the website. Thanks for joining me, Paddy and Jesse, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks with more Linux news, reviews, comment, and generally being grumpy. Goodbye, everybody. Stay neutral, everybody. (laughs) See you later. (laughs) 